Welcome to the class. In last class, we had seen that the Rankine cycle, uh, how does it operate and then what are the components of Rankine cycle, what are the processes which comprise a Rankine cycle and which are the components which execute those processes, which are the things which would be known to us in the different corners of the Rankine cycle, those are also seen and if we want to execute heat and energy interact, heat and work interaction for the Rankine cycle, how to proceed with. Then we had also seen that how to look into the steam table and find out different enthalpies or entropies whatsoever they are required for us. Having those things none, known, we have also seen what are the different performance parameters of the Rankine cycle which were like different efficiencies. Now we are going to go ahead and see what is the, what are the other uh, factors which would be dealing with steam power cycles. So, the first thing what we would be discussing today is mean temperature of heat addition. Here we know that our Rankine cycle is comprised of four processes in which process 2 to 3 is heat addition process at constant pressure, but the process 2 to 3 has pressure to be constant, but temperature is expected to vary in this pro in this manner as this heat addition as we have seen is done in economizer, this heat addition is done in latent phase, latent heat is added in the evaporator and the super heat is added into the superator. So, the sensible heat part which deals with the two components which are economizer and superheater they lead to a change in temperature, but we would like to find out what is the mean temperature of heat addition or maybe mean temperature of heat rejection as well. So, in this case we would do this thing, we can reformulate the same process, same cycle with a new sketch where process 2 to 3 is replaced by process 5 to 6 such that area under the curve 2 to 3, so area under the curve 2 to 3 process is equal to area under the curve 5 to 6, but the peculiarity of process 5 to 6 is it is a constant temperature process. However, we do not say here that process 5 to 6 is a isobaric heat addition, but we are interested in finding out what is the mean temperature of heat addition in case of the boiler. So, having known this, we know now Q in is amount of heat added into the boiler which is equal to H 3 which is equal to H 3 minus H 2, but H 3 minus H 2 is equal to T mean into S 3 minus S 2. Basically, this is the constant temperature, we know that T d S is equal to d H minus V d P d Q, we know from second law d Q is equal to T d S. So, if we integrate from 2 to 3, so, but area under the curve is same. So, this integration can be done between 5 to 6. So, 5 to 6 is a constant temperature process, this is Q in. So, 5 to 6 is a constant temperature process, so which we call it as T min and then it happens to be T 6 minus T 5, but T 6 is equal to T 6 is equal to T 4 or T 3 and T 2 is equal to T 1. So, sorry S 6 is equal to S 4 or S 3 and S 2 is equal to S 1 or S 5. So, we can comfortably write here that S 6 minus S 5. So, S 6 is equal to S 3 and S 2 is as it is, S 5 is equal to S 2. So, heat addition can be found out by H 3 minus H 2, but H 3 minus H 2 is equal to T min into S 3 minus S 2. Then 
we have T min is equal to H3 minus H2 divided by S3 minus S2, which further would lead to T min is equal to S H3 minus H2 divided by S4 minus S1. Since S3 is equal to S6 is equal to S4 and S2 is equal to S1 is equal to S5, which we can take any of the entropies. So, this is what the method of calculation of T min for the isobaric process of heat addition. Parallelly, if I am interested in finding out what is the mean temperature of heat rejection, but then finding out that is not that difficult since in the process 4 to 1, although we say that it is an isobaric process, but this process is a phase change process. So, there temperature is also constant. So, we actually have temperature constant in this process. So, mean temperature of heat rejection T mean rejection is equal to T 4 is equal to T 1. So, that is not that difficult to find out. If this process would have variation of temperature, then we would have evaluated it by the same method as what we did for the temperature addition process, heat addition process. Then we are talking about now till time we were discussing about Rankine cycle which is an ideal cycle where all the components behaved as the ideal components where there are no losses. But now, we might encounter with the losses in the different components of Rankine cycle. Here, let us consider the, the irreversibility which is of internal kind. We mean internal irreversibility means the flow which is passing through the different components encounters the loss while flowing into the circuit of the Rankine cycle. So, losses due to heat transfer are negligible into the pump and turbine because the process which is getting executed in pump and turbine is isentropic expansion in the turbine and isentropic compression in the pump. The process being isentropic it is very fast it is so it is adiabatic it is as well reversible that is what our expectation is. The loss in this process which is 1 to 2 dash or 3 to 4 or in the pump or in the turbine takes place so rapidly such that there is no much chance for heat to be getting lost or heat interaction with the surrounding for the working medium. So, we expect that the losses due to heat transfer are negligible in the pumps and in the turbines, but the major loss is lost due to friction. So, frictional losses are important into the turbine and pump. So, we have to find out what is the efficiency of turbine. So, turbine efficiency or isentropic efficiency of a turbine is defined as actual work output of the turbine divided by ideal work output of the turbine. We know that turbine is a work producing machine. So, actually it would produce lesser work than the ideal case or than the required. Hence, in the case of Rankine cycle or here we would have come isentropically down from 3 to 4 dash when we are talking about ideal process of expansion, isentropic expansion, but instead of coming straight in the process, we would come by an unknown path, but reach to point 4 and that path being unknown we are and irreversible we are showing it by a dotted line. So, ideally we have got expansion from 3 to 4, ideally we had got expansion from 3 to 4 dash. So, efficiency of the turbine is actual work which is H 3 minus H 4 divided by ideal work which is H 3 minus H 4 dash. Then we have pump work. In case of pump as well, 
we expect to go straight up as what expected from 1 to 2 dash, but we encounter frictional loss in the pump and then the process in reality would lead to 0.2 instead of 2 dash. So, here we know that pump is a work absorbing machine, it being an absorbing machine ideally it would absorb less work, but actually it would absorb more work. So, pump efficiency is defined as ideal work input divided by actual pump work input. Therefore, in the present case we have pump efficiency is equal to H 2 dash minus H 1 divided by H 2 minus H 1. So, these two efficiencies are very much required when we are dealing with turbines or pump or maybe compressors when they are not ideal. Further, there will be loss due to the piping system where pressure loss is taken place due in the pump exit, boiler exit and turbine entry. We expect the process 2 to 3 to be isobaric process, but in the case where we are having different pipings and further there is frictional loss, the pressure in this circuit gets decreased. So, we expect that there is 2 pressure at the entry to the boiler or steam generator which is at the exit to the pump, but we get different pressure at the exit of the boiler and then further we get different pressure at the entry to the turbine. So, the three entities which expected to have pump exit, boiler completely and turbine inlet which was expected to have same pressure due to pressure loss in friction or due to piping they encounter loss in head, but then there is external irreversibility also along with internal irreversibility. When we say that there is external irreversibility, we mean that we are talking about the surrounding which is supplying the heat or which is losing the heat um, to the working medium which is steam. Parallelly, if we see the steam generator, then typical circuit in the steam generator is like this which we are going to see elaborate in the class of the steam generator, but here we have water getting heated where the combustion chamber where we are having combustion products generated due to the process of combustion may be we can use oil or we can use coal those gases of combustion would pass over the tubes which are having the water. So, this way we are having heat transfer between the flue gases and the working medium which is water. Otherwise also we would have water stored in a tank and then the hot coal would get burnt and then the flue gases would get transferred through the tubes and in this process they would lose their heat to the water which would get converted into the steam and further steam would be passed to the turbine. This is the case for the boiler. Further, in case of condenser, we expect that steam would enter into the condenser, then there will be coolant in which is a coolant generally as I said, it is natural resources which are used for the process of condensation. So, water from river or ocean would be used here and then that water would take the heat from the steam which is entering into the condenser, water will get heated in this process. So, this is a coolant which is hot now at the exit of the condenser, but steam which is entering into the condenser would get condensed to the liquid at the outlet. So, there is heat transfer between coolant water and steam, there is heat transfer between combustion products and liquid water or water in principle in two phase. So, we expect that the process 2 to 3 is heat addition process into the steam generator or boiler, but for that heat addition we expect that there is the flue gas which is passing on T s diagram 
like this in a process A D C B process process A D C B is for gases and process 2 2 S 1 2 S V and 3 is for water. So, water will get heated in this phase and then flue gases will get cold or become colder in this process. So, the temperature difference between these two entities flue gas and the steam is leading to irreversibilities and these are called as external irreversibilities. Further, there would be external irreversibility in the condenser also. We have the condensation process between 4 to 1, 4 is the entry to the condenser for the steam and 1 is the exit to the condenser for the water. This condensation would take place with liquid water from the natural resource which will get heated from E to F. But the major point to be remembered over here that one entity which is steam is changing its phase from 4 to 1. So, whether the flow of water is in the direction or parallel to the steam or water is not going to affect the amount of heat transfer or the irreversibility which are incurred in the process of condensation. So, this has this part which is a condenser has less amount of improvisation chance for the external irreversibilities, but this part which is the external irreversibility dominant part which is a boiler part has a lot of scope for improvisation to remove or reduce the external irreversibilities. Then as we said that we have flue gases which are going to warm or which are going to heat the water into the steam generator then these flue gases would get cold or would become cooler or which will get cooled in the process ADCB and water would get heated in the process 2 to 3. Temperature difference between flue gases and water leads to irreversibility in the heat transfer process as what we have discussed earlier. We know that any process would be reversible when there are less and less amount of gradient or rather practically when there are gradients are 0 processes are reversible. But if this big temperature gradient exists between system and surrounding then process would be irreversible. So, the minimum temperature difference is noted at two points this point is minimum temperature difference point and this point is also a second minimum temperature difference point and these points where minimum temperature difference between the flue gas and the steam is encountered is called as pinch point temperature difference. Pinch point temperature difference. So, it is the minimum difference between the working medium and the flue gases. Pinch point difference actually should be as minimum as possible such that we can reduce the irreversibilities which are there in the process of heat transfer. If we want to reduce the irreversibilities, we have to reduce the pinch point temperature difference, but we know that heat transfer is dependent upon temperature difference, but along with that it is also dependent upon surface area. But we want certain amount of heat to be transferred from the flue gas to the water. So, we expect H 3 minus H 2 is amount of heat which needs to be transferred from flue gas to the water, but for that amount of heat to be transferred we need that strong temperature gradient or we need very large surface area. So, in order to have pinch point difference lower we have to increase surface area. So, here optimum pinch point temperature difference is based upon the cost effectiveness of the user of the plant or designer. So, cooling water case as we discussed it is not going to alter any change in irreversibility since one of the materials is undergoing the phase change. So, the temperature difference between the 
condenser gas, a condenser steam or water and the water which is the coolant is not going to decide the irreversibility which is encountered in the process of condensation. So, at gross there are external irreversibilities like internal irreversibilities and we have to work towards reduction of internal and external irreversibilities. Internal irreversibilities as we have discussed they are mainly due to friction and making the passages very smooth we can reduce the internal irreversibility. Similarly, external irreversibility can be reduced if we can reduce the temperature difference between the flue gases and the steam which is passing through the steam generator. Then there are other performance parameters for the steam power plant. Thermal efficiency is basically not the only performance parameter upon which steam power plant is judged. So, the other performance parameter is called as work ratio. Work ratio here is defined as Wt minus Wp divided by Wt. So, Wt minus Wp is a network and Wt is the turbine work. So, network upon turbine work is the work ratio. Now, let us see significance of this term which is called as work ratio. Consider that there are two cycles cycle 1 and cycle 2. In case of cycle 1 and cycle 2 initially let us consider that both the cycles are ideal. So, cycle 1 can be one ideal cycle, cycle 2 can be other ideal cycle. Here in this cycle Q in is amount of heat added and which is same for both the cycles, but W t in one cycle we get 100 unit of uh, turbine work, but in other cycle we get 40 units of turbine work. Let us consider that the pump work for one cycle is 61, but for the other cycle is further small and it is 1. So, till this point we have assumed, we have assumed Q 1, we have assumed W t, we have assumed W p. So, W t minus W p is network. So, we see that network is same in cycle 1 and in cycle 2. So, we can see that efficiency is also same where efficiency is defined as network upon Q in. So, Q in is same, network is same. So, efficiency is same, but now let us find out which is called as work ratio. This work ratio is defined as W net upon W t. We have seen that W net is 39, W t is 61. So, 39 upon 61 leads to 0 0.390 work ratio for cycle 1, but very high work ratio for cycle 2 which is 0.975. But this was all for the ideal cycle. Let us consider the same two cycles, cycle 1 and cycle 2 with 90 percent efficiency of the components and major components as what we say as turbine and pump. So, Q in is same, but W t was 100, but now efficiency is 90 percent. So, turbine work is 90 and turbine work from 40 would get released to 36. Pump work is 61, 61 divided by 0.9. So, we get 67.5 as pump work in cycle 1 and we get 1 divided by 0.9, so which is 1.1. So, this is now again known thing. Here onwards W t minus W p is network which is here and we have network as this much in cycle 2. Then W net upon Q in is efficiency of cycle 1, this is efficiency of cycle 2, but then we can as well calculate work ratio the major points to be noted over here. We get 43 percent decrement in efficiency for cycle 1 and 10 percent for cycle 2. We can see that without having any change in the Q in, we got higher work ratio initially for cycle 2, but that high work ratio has indicated one thing which we are understanding now that if work ratio is high, then the efficiency change due to 
component efficiency is less and in present case it is only 10 percent for cycle 2, but in case of cycle 1 there is lot of change in efficiency and it is 43 percent. So, if work ratio is low then component efficiencies would lead to lot of change in the, the thermal efficiency of the cycle, but if work ratio is high then we do not have to worry too much that would not alter the efficiency of the cycle. There is 37 percent decrement in work ratio, but 0 0.6 percent decrement in work ratio for cycle 2. So, this is what the indication what work ratio gives us. Therefore, one should choose a cycle thermodynamic cycle which has less sensitivity to the component efficiencies and desired value of work ratio is as high as possible. We have seen that just we made component efficiency from 100 percent to 90 percent then that small change in the efficiency of the components has led to large change in turbine power and so it has led to large change in W net and it has large made the large change in thermal efficiency for cycle 1 and cycle 2. So, what we expect is to use a thermodynamic cycle which has higher work ratio. Work ra we use any cycle which has higher thermal efficiency since it can utilize the available Q in effectively and produces maximum network, but this is not the sole method to compare one cycle with the other in that we have seen that work ratio is an other parameter which is very important since it tells us that what is the life cycle of the component or till what time we have to continue with the existing component. So, work ratio gives a light upon effectiveness or how much would be the change in efficiency if we have certain amount of change in the component efficiencies. So, if system is more reliable upon component efficiencies then in that case we have to use higher work ratio cycle. So, there is other performance parameter. So, if there are two cycles which are getting compared with each other then we have following things which are important to be used to compare two cycles of different power plants and one such is called as specific steam consumption or steam rate. So, this steam rate is defined as the 1 upon W net amount of steam required to produce unit amount of work. So, if we multiply that unit by 3600 then it turns out to be kg per kilowatt hour. So, 1 upon W net is specific steam consumption and 3600 by W net is again specific steam consumption, but with different unit which is kg per kilowatt hour and in one case unit is kg per kilowatt. So, this is the other performance parameter which is called as specific steam consumption or steam rate. The other performance parameter is called as heat rate, it is defined as amount of heat required to produce unit amount of network. So, amount of heat input divided by network is practically 1 upon efficiency. Specific steam consumption actually tells us about how much steam is required to produce the given work output. And if specific steam consumption is high means we need a bigger boiler, if specific steam consumption is low means we need a smaller boiler for storage or generating the steam. Similarly, if heat rate is higher that means combustion of the fuel is of not good quality and then heat rate means we are having amount of heat to be higher if we need we are getting same amount of work from other side. So, this is how um, how much amount of coal oil to be burned to generate certain amount of power that is what heat rate is, what is the amount of steam which need to be supplied to the turbine to produce work is called a specific steam consumption.
now we are seeing what do we mean by Carnot cycle. We had already seen that there is Rankine cycle and in Rankine cycle there are 4 processes. Now we are going to see that in the steam cycle we can as well consider we can as well consider Carnot cycle. Here the major thing to be noted is that pump your comp in the Rankine cycle is getting replaced by compressor since as what we can see the steam which is at the entry to the steam generator is wet steam. Since this steam is wet we cannot use pump to pump the liquid from 1 to 2 point. So, therefore, since we cannot use pump or it is unlikely to use pump since the we have to handle two phase mixture. So, process 2 to 3 will be governed in generally by scrap, uh, compressor. So, we have compressor instead of pump, then we have heat addition, then we have expansion and then we have condensation. Rest of the processes are as it is. This is HS diagram for same Carnot cycle. Here we can observe a thing that the turbine work over here is huge as compared to the pump work. So, turbine work is large, pump work is very less in case of our Rankine cycle. But when we are working with Carnot cycle as what we are saying here that we are working with Carnot cycle. So, since our objective is to study for Carnot cycle in this slide. In this slide we can say that we can see that we can see that this is the turbine work and this is the compressor work. So, the compressor work and turbine work they are having comparable amounts, but in case of Rankine cycle we have large turbine work and small compressor work or pump work. So, this is the composition of Carnot cycle which again comprised of compressor, boiler, turbine and condenser. Process 1 to 2 is in the compressor, process 2 to 3 is in the boiler, process 3 to 4 is in the turbine. So, this is typical Carnot cycle. Now, we will solve an example of Carnot cycle. Here example states that calculate heat and work transfer in different processes of corner cycle if it operates between 30 bar and 0 0.04 bar pressures. Okay. Also calculate specific steam consumption and work ratio consider all the processes to be ideal. So, here what is the given thing to us? We are said that the pressure of the boiler is 30 bar we are said that pressure of the condenser is 0 0.04 bar. So, these two pressures are given to us. So, ultimately for us it is given that P 2 is equal to P 3 is equal to 30 bar and then we can make use of steam table over here since we know that we are working with Carnot cycle and that is why Carnot cycle has 4 processes which are the processes as isentropic compression, constant temperature heat addition, constant um, isentropic expansion and constant temperature heat rejection. These are the 4 processes of Carnot cycle and to execute those 4 processes which are, which are there in the Carnot cycle which we cannot come out of the steam dome. We have to remain inside the dome to execute the processes which are comprising the Carnot cycle. So, here we have point 2 and this point 2 has to be on the saturation line. Similarly, point 3 has to be on the saturation line. Then only process 2 to 3 will become isothermal process. Otherwise, as what we have seen in case of Rankine cycle, process 2 to 3 is constant pressure process, but in which there is a chance that temperature would change. That is why point 2 is known to us, point 3 is also 
known to us. So, 0.2 and 0.3 temperatures are found out from steam table as saturation temperature and that turns out to be corresponding to 30 bar it is 507 Kelvin. Then we can equally find out from the steam table what is the enthalpy at 0.2 which is the liquid saturation enthalpy and that is for 30 bar it is 1008 kilojoule per kg. Similarly, we can find out what is enthalpy at 0.3 and it is 2803 which is a saturation enthalpy of steam. Knowing these enthalpies, we actually need to find what is the enthalpy at 1 and what is the enthalpy at 4, but we do not know those points. But we know one thing that they are somewhere on this line and we know further that they are exactly the intersection with two vertical lines. So, S2 is equal to S1 is known to us and we as well know S3 is equal to S4 since process 1 to 2 and process 3 to 4 are isentropic processes. So, for that all sake what we can do is we can go to the steam table and find out what is entropy corresponding to liquid saturation point and what is entropy corresponding steam saturation point dry saturation point of the steam. So, once those entropies are known we will go back uh, to the steam table corresponding to the pressure which is 0.04 bar and for which temperature is 302.2 Kelvin. Here we get an answer that X4 is equal to 0.716 and X1 is equal to 0.726. One thing we have to remember over here that we know now S4, we want to find out uh, basically enthalpy at 4, for that we have to first find out dryness fraction at 0.4. So, for that we know S4 is equal to S3, but what is S4? S4 is SF which is liquid saturation enthalpy corresponding to 0.04 bar plus X into SFG which is the latent entropy change corresponding to 0.04 bar and this X4 is the dryness fraction at 0.4. So, S, S3 is known to us, SF is known to us from the steam table, SFG is known to us from the steam table. So, X4 can be found out. Similarly, we can find out X1 where we know S1 is equal to S2 is equal to SF plus X1 into SFG. Here as well SFG is known, SF is known, S2 is known we can find out x1 and these x1 and x4 are mentioned here as 0.716 and 0.276. So, h4 can be found out then, then we know h4 is equal to hf plus x4 into hfg. Here hfg is given in the steam table, hf is given in the steam table where hf is the liquid saturation enthalpy corresponding to, we can find out H4 by writing HF plus X4 into HFG, where HF is the liquid saturation enthalpy corresponding to 0.04 bar condenser pressure and HFG is the latent enthalpy or latent heat corresponding to 0.04 bar saturation pressure, then we can know H4. Similarly, we can write H1 is equal to HF plus X1 into HFG where as well HFG and HF are known, X1 has been calculated, so we know H1. So, H1 and H4 are thus calculated. Knowing those, we can find out turbine work, we know turbine work is H3 minus H4 and that is 940 kilojoule per kg. We know compressor work is H2 minus H1 that is 215 kilojoule per kg, then we can find out W net and W net is W t minus W c turbine work minus compressor work and it turns out to be 725 kilojoule per kg. So, further we can find out Q in, we know that Q in is H 3 minus H 2, this is Q in 
and we know h 3, we know h 2 and then we can find out h 3 minus h 2 and then that is 1795 kilojoule per kg. Similarly, we can find out q out where q out is h 4 minus h 1, h 4 is known to us, h 1 is known to us. So, it turns out to be q out is equal to 1070 kilojoule per kg. Then we have efficiency and that efficiency is w net upon q in and then w net upon q in turns out to be 40.4 percent for the present Carnot cycle and work ratio is 0.771. This is the example for the Carnot cycle. Here further we were expected to calculate specific steam consumption and as per the formula of specific steam consumption it is 3600 upon w net. So, it turns out to be 4.97 kilojoule per kilowatt hour this much steam would be required to produce our network of 725 kilojoule per kg. This is how we can make use of steam table to find out or to evaluate an example which is which would be given to us. And this was the illustration for finding out the performance parameters or work and heat interaction parameters for the Carnot cycle. We will see rest of the things in the next class. Thank you.